Welcome to the Hot Sauce. This is Angel Plumel, a registered dietitian nutritionist in Seattle, Washington. I'm currently at 173 subscribers, and the goal is to make it to 250 by the end of the year. So please help a brother out and like, comment, and subscribe. You can also catch this, previous, and future episodes on your favorite podcasting platforms. Let's get right into it. Today, we are going to feature Nina Crowley, a registered dietitian nutritionist that resides in Charleston, South Carolina. All right, well, welcome back to the hot sauce. Today we have a uh, special episode. Every episode is a special episode. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Extra special episode. So today's your special episode. So today we have Nina Crowley with me and I am going to go ahead. We're going to put her in the hot seat here. So she's going to be on the big screen. And why don't you go ahead and tell us about your journey into this profession? What, uh, what inspired you to join, where you went to schools, where you did your internship, your jobs. Um, yep, just go ahead. Let's talk about it. Go. All right. Well, thanks, Angel. I appreciate being on here and the chance to talk about myself for as long as you'll let me. Um, I have always uh, really kind of dreamed of being able to reflect and have enough content to fill at least a podcast episode. So, um, so yeah. So, hey, I'm, I'm Nina. Um, I have been a dietitian since a about 2005, I guess. And um, yeah, thinking back about my story has been, it's been kind of interesting and fun. And I chatted with my parents this morning, actually, to hear a little bit about their their feedback. And they reminded me of a, actually a really funny story. So back, I'm mean, taking you way back to when I was six months old. And uh -huh. uh, my dad, my dad went to Cornell, which is where I did my undergrad as well. And he reminded me of a study that I was in as a six month old. And I was actually uh, it was about texture. And so I was crawling on a platform and you could crawl down and go one side had like a certain like black and uh, textured area. And the other was like a white or kind of checkered. And they reminded me that um, I was the first baby to crawl down the exact center, not choose either side and like forge my own path. And so I always kind of think of that story as like, okay, I guess I was a little bit leadership driven when I was a baby. And so, um, so that was my, my first Cornell story and <laughs> I, have, I have lots more, but yeah, I, um, you know, at, after six months old, I had a, a while of kind of being focused on health and uh, behavior and nutrition. And I didn't really know where that would lead me. But um, in about 10th grade, when I was kind of in that, let's decide where you want to go to college, take a road trip with your dad kind of uh, phase. Uh, he took me actually to a aptitude testing in Boston in one of these old brownstones and it was kind of on the Boston college circuit. And I looked at that feedback. I still have it. It's pretty ancient looking, but um, looking at that feedback, it's like, wow, some of the aptitudes you have when you're in high school really do predict, you know, who you are here at 40. Um, things that I think I know so well about myself. Um, I, you know, looking back that long ago, it was there all along. So I thought that was a pretty fun kind of connection. And, and yeah, sort of like this field has always been something um, I've been interested in. And, and I know a lot of people found it, you know, later in life, but I definitely knew going into college, um, you know, wanting to go to Cornell, wanting to go into nutrition, that that was what I was going to do. And so I sort of stuck with that from the beginning. Um, I definitely had, um, I had a time in, later in high school where I was trying to decide what, what summer experience I was going to do, you know, and I did all this research and didn't have a lot of money to do it. So I ended up, I remember seeing like two, two feet tall of these brochures that I was thinking about going on hiking and all the different experiences I could do. And I ended up actually at Cornell doing this communications and journalism, um, two week experience. It, it ended up being the cheapest and it ended up actually being pretty formative to what I wanted to do. And it got me there and seeing what they had to offer. And, and now actually thinking back, you know, communication and journalism was not something I was interested in back then. And now I think that's probably more of what I'm into than anything else. So, so that was sort of what got me there. And then, um, and then did my undergrad um, with that team nutrition science at Cornell loved Love that experience. Still stay in touch with those folks. They all came to my wedding and, um, you know, I, I still stay in touch with the, the Cornell people and a 
couple of the interns as well. Um, and then went to my internship at Stony Brook on Long Island. So I'm from Long Island, wanted to kind of get back home for a little bit and did that at SUNY Stony Brook. And um, that was actually paired with a master's in healthcare policy and management. And again, at the time, it kind of just worked out. That was what they offered. I wanted to do the dual internship and uh, master's. But again, policy ended up becoming a huge focus of my career. And I'm so glad that that was kind of my formative time of that. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of my training. That's what got me into that. And then when I was done with... Um, with Stony Brook, they offered me a position doing, uh, being a WIC dietitian. And I worked with one of my mentors in the program and that was fantastic for about a year. And she went out on maternity leave and I got to kind of run the show, which showed me a little bit about management, which ended up being, you know, again, something that I kind of got into a little bit later and loved. Um, and then it was kind of time to say, okay, like Long Island is quite expensive. And, um, on my dietitian salary, I was still working in a restaurant and <laughs> had to figure out what I was going to do next. And um, that sort of led me down to looking at uh, moving down south. And so I we landed in South Carolina in Charleston. This is back before everybody knew about Charleston and everyone would say, oh, is that North Carolina? And I'd say, no, South it's Charleston. Carolina. You've got to come visit. And now everyone's like, oh, my God, I love it there. I had my bachelorette there. <laughs> so exactly. Now yeah. we're like, don't don't move here. It's great. But there's enough people. So, um, so I came down here in, um, 2006 and so started in, I just knew I wanted to work at the medical university and USC medical university of South Carolina. That was the big place to be. Um, and at that point I didn't care. I just wanted to do something. I wanted to get into, you know, that probably what your listeners are, are all hearing like, Oh, you have to start in inpatient. I remember hearing that over and over and I said, you know, it's probably not what I want to do, but let's try that. And so I, you know, I looked and at all the jobs they had open and just kind of said, I just want to be here and ended up um, not even doing an official interview, but getting a job doing um, kind of that generic entry level general, gen general RD. Gen med, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, pulmonary Institute of Psychiatry. And, and actually the, the girls who know me from, from there will laugh because that Institute of Psychiatry piece of the position was always that thing that got kicked down to the next person. So a new person was hired. Oh, you want to do the IOP? Yeah, it's great. And then they'd send you over there. And most often people hated it. Um, but turns out like that was actually the one thing every week that I liked. There was a group class and it was with folks who, you know, they were always the same because they were over at the Institute of Psychiatry for a really long time. And I ended up doing group nutrition counseling. Um, this is back when, remember when you could get fiber one samples like mailed to you at home? So I would get this big box of fiber one mailed to me and I'd bring in these packets and I'd go in there and talk about fiber and um, healthy eating. And everybody thought I was like crazy, but I loved it because I would see the same people. I was able to do sort of counseling, which I didn't for me feel like I got in the inpatient setting. And so that was really kind of for me that time where I said, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to be doing um, counseling. And so actually the the next, this was a Sodexo account. So with Sodexo, I knew there would be, you know, a job in their outpatient uh, world that would come open. And the next one that came open was bariatric surgery. And so I said, yes, that's it. That's me. I'm going to do it. And um, so after a year of doing uh, inpatient, I moved into bariatric surgery. And that's kind of been my professional home for the past uh, 16 or 17 years. I started in, um, you know, a, there was a position with two of us and actually Debbie Pettipane, who's a connection between the two of us. She was the lead dietitian and she and I ended up um, working together and really having this kind of incredible symbiotic, really fantastic relationship. And I, you know, one of my sort of tips for anyone who's in the field is really to find that person who's your, just like your, your work sister or your, you know, your just person. And she was that for me. So she and I still to this day, you know, meet regularly, talk through, you know, professional development and really work on getting, you know, to the next level, but it started there. So we shared a tiny little office together. Um, but part of that was instead of just doing the basic, counseling and doing our job, we really spent a lot of time just chatting about what was possible, what we could do next. And we did all sorts of crazy classes and, um, 
you know, we remember, I, I remember vividly tracking in like one of my home toaster oven, like dragging that into, schlepping that into work and toasting some like homemade pizzas for our patients and trying to do this and that. And like only with Debbie would that have been possible. So, so she and I had, I think seven or eight years together where we really worked on just whatever, whatever idea we had, we'd chat about it, we'd make it happen. And it was big and it was creative. And it was really, for me, a way to have a creative outlet where I hadn't, I hadn't really had that before. So, so that was a pretty formative time. And then during that time, I also was in charge of a, um, of a research project looking at weight regain, or sorry, actually looking at, um, bariatric patients before they had surgery. I was in charge of like consenting them to this research study, looking at their health behaviors. Um, and it was going to go out till three years. So I got involved in that. And, and this is like every aspect of a research study, like writing the study number, going to the post office, getting stamps, getting the data back, entering it into a database, but it ended up leading to like writing up an abstract about the results. And so when that six month data came in and I did my first abstract with a, with a research mentor that was at NUSC, I started thinking like, wow, this is actually, this is really interesting. And I love sort of this research, you know, outlet of being able to take what we know in practice as a clinician to actually like sharing that at a professional conference. So I think that was my first research poster I did on six month outcomes of this study and just loved it. And so that at that point I was kind of like, well, between that and then doing the counseling for bariatric patients, I really started to say, I don't have enough psychology. You know, I, I did motivational interviewing a class or two, you know, we did what, what was available at the time, but then actually doing the counseling was just so much different and so much harder. And I just felt like I needed more. And so I, you know, here's my joke is always that I went to school for a PhD in psychology to be a better dietitian. And I know that sounds crazy and like maybe not the most financially sound decision, but it really did. It made me a much better counselor. I was able to take classes on sort of like behavioral nutrition and um, the psychology of of eating and, and some of these things that were just so much more complex than just what I thought it would be, which was more learn the information, reiterate that to the patients. Like, I know what you should do and here it is. Now go and do it. But then when you're working with chronic diseases like obesity and, and bariatric surgery, which is highly, you know, nuanced and complicated. And you, you're really close with these patients for a really long time. It was so much harder than just, here's your diet, go follow it. And so all the classes that, you know, during that time taking that, like, I think really made me a much better um, counseling dietitian. And so that was kind of during that, you know, I think it was five or six years of doing my PhD and, and being a dietitian for the bariatric program. That was really where I really kind of fell into what I think I'm, I'm really good at, which is, you know, seeing people where they're at and then helping them with some, you know, counseling tools that I learned. And so that was kind of my thing. Um, but then, you know, you finish your degree and you've got to think about what's next. And so at that point, what I found myself a little bit more drawn to was actually the leadership aspect of um, of the program. So, you know, I was kind of working with my mentor at the time um, on what I could do next and kind of trying to develop a, a bariatric surgery director position. We had a coordinator, we had a manager kind of, but I wanted to be the director. So worked on that. Um, but then as, as you know, how things go, someone quit and the coordinator position came open and it was kind of like, oh yeah, you should do that. Um, so that would probably be a, an advice piece for some of your listeners too, would be not, I fell into that because it was there and because it made sense and because it was easy for everyone. But I definitely had some conversations of like, oh, well, if you were a nurse, you'd be making a little bit more. And I'm like, really? A PhD, RD? Like, really? And so I think I, you know, at that point really should have advocated for a much better salary for myself or at least much better um, leadership tracking because that I, I got in there and then I kind of clawed my way to get a little bit higher up. But had I started where I knew I should have been, I think I really would have been um, in a better place. But 
it ended up being, you know, six years as a bariatric coordinator. It was really rewarding. I was able to do so many of the things, you know, from a leadership perspective. I, I went to a couple leadership uh, training courses and, and I loved it. I was able to, I had all the autonomy. Um, I was, it was one of these, like, I didn't realize I could be great at that job. And then I got in there and was just, it, it, it fit. I, I knew what to do. I knew all the issues. I knew what I wanted to, to fix. And that was kind of my role. I was a fixer. I was a, you know, some people call that an enabler, but um, <laughs> that's a different, that's a different story, but yeah, I loved it. So I, I was able to kind of rock that position, I think. And, um, and yeah, and then, you know, um, but in the middle of all of that, you know, which is, I would say a huge part of my career has been a lot of volunteer positions. So not to say that work wasn't rewarding. It really, it, it had its place, but because it wasn't really letting me stoke all my connection, my creative, these parts of me, I ended up doing a lot of volunteering. So first it was my um, local, so Charleston Dietetic Association, then the state, um, and then our, you know, DPG with weight management. And then I got involved in the um, ASMBS, which is the Bariatric Society nationally. And through all of those positions, you know, leadership positions, that was where I really got to see all of it come together, connecting with other people in my field, working on projects that helped you know, sort of like what you're doing here, like helped bring other people along. That was really a passion of mine was like, I, what I've learned and it's taken me five years, let me try to teach someone new in, you know, two conversations so that we can just right. keep moving things along. Right. Absolutely. I mean, so I love that. I love that about it. And, and as a result, all of those, to me, all that's sort of what this career is all about is all these connections that you make with people along the way end up somewhere, you know? So I think finally, so I turned 40 this year and I think finally I'm like, all right, now I'm, I'm going to work on the principles of like essentialism. This is a, you know, a, a book that I've read a couple of times. I don't know if you've read it. Um, no, I no, tried no. really hard to embody that, but it's, it goes against what I, what I am, but I'm going to say no to some stuff, but it's like, I say yes to everything I'm interested in and I'm interested in so much, but I think in that early phase saying yes to things, really I can see now that like each yes to something ended up like putting me, I, I vividly remember, and I'm going to give you a picture of this so you can show it being at a bariatric conference where they invited me to talk about nutrition, vitamins or whatever. And it's a state chapter is my state chapter. And um, I'm on the faculty with 10 other dudes in suits, the surgeons, and then there's me, and I'm like talking to them about this nutrition stuff. And you know, they all have dietitians on their team that that they're doing it. I'm like, this is crazy. Why are we're all paying membership fees? Why aren't we all at this meeting? And so that was a really like a turning point of we need to get other people involved. And so, you know, we made the state chapter turn into, you know, by the time you know I started working on it the next year, we had a hundred integrated health people at the meeting and we kicked out the 30 surgeons to the small group room at the meeting. And we did this meeting for the integrated health folks. And it was so rewarding. You know, it was just a different experience, but, you know, saying yes to that talk at that meeting led to um, them inviting me to be on this video project that ended up going to all the bariatric centers. And so I still have people be like, Oh, that's you that did that little video. I'm like, yeah, that was my yes to something that turned into something else. And I, I think that cascade of things, you know, you do something, you do a good job at it. You get invited to do the next thing. That really is to me, the real fun part about this career is all these different ways we intersect and who we meet and how we get um, networked to do the next thing. So, yeah. So that kind of, I mean, really fun to think about it in this perspective, which I haven't done. I think all of that led me to my next thing, which was when um, I had a, a friend of mine who worked for uh, Sika, the company that I work for now, um, you know, kind of, run into me at a meeting and say, Oh, this is what you're doing. We started kind of connecting about that and realizing that, you know, he was working in the field of weight management and obesity and health. Um, and so we started talking about that and that kind of evolved into a conversation and he was seeing the stuff that I was doing and then offered me sort of this position as, um, what I'm doing now, which is professional affiliations and education for a company that makes body composition equipment. 
that just sort of evolved and it and it felt right. It was like this is the next step and I'm I'm ready to kind of take a leap into something new. Uh, and that's what I've been doing for the past year. So um so I get to work with um all the professional associations that I used to volunteer for, um all the, you know, dietitians and other healthcare professionals that I used to sort of network with. Now I'm talking to them about, you know, hey guys, remember how we're um you know how we always say BMI is not a good enough outcome to measure, you know, the success and and maybe it does have some bias associated with it and you know now like like we have better tools. We have sophisticated, you know, devices that can help you measure what your body is made up of and when you lose weight it's not just losing pounds, it's losing, you know, body fat and muscle mass and how do we preserve that? So it's it's been a really cool jump to talking to some of these people that used to be my colleagues and doing the same job as me to saying like, Oh gosh, how can we get this into your center so that you can, you know, keep up with the evidence and, and be practicing what you're learning about. And um, so I felt really, it's been really interesting in this role. Cause I, I always thought working for an industry company type role would be, you'd have to give up something like in a, Mm -hmm. authentic, genuine piece. Like, Ooh, I'd have to like do sales, which seemed so, Ooh, that's not in line with my core values. And I'm very aligned with what I believe in. Right. But it's been the opposite. It's been like, I believe in this so strongly that it's actually making me like able to talk about it professional to professional in such a natural way that's been great. And then educating people about stuff that, you know, they didn't learn in their internship. You know, you, I, we learned about, oh, DEXA, oh, you know, body composition, maybe RMR testing. But I feel like then you get into a job and you kind of get in there and just do whatever that clinic or that place has. And so it's been really fun sort of learning the science and the biochemistry and all of that about body composition and bioimpedance and teaching colleagues of mine and others about how they can integrate that into their practice. So, so yeah, that's, awesome. that's kind of it. That's where I am now. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate that. I mean, you, you're just, I let you do your thing. It was awesome to hear. Um, I guess if you do have that aptitude test, that would be very interesting to see because I think it would be if, if this is what lined up for you. Um, no, thank you for that. That was, that was great to hear your story and your narrative. I think the, I got a bachelor's in psychology and like I told you before we got on, you know, I wanted to go get a PhD in sports psych. So it's kind of one of these that the psychology realm does give us a little more of an ability to work with everybody. You're able to kind of see it from different angles and we're trying to, yeah. you know, crack the, crack the problem here. And sometimes if we just doing it from a clinical perspective, it's like the art and the science, how does it intersect to, it is. to deal with people, you know? So, so and now I, I appreciate think that. The more the more I, I always feel like the more I learned about psychology, the less I was able to, to do any of that. I mean, what I picture that advice giving, right? You know, and if you're in a counseling practice, you know, you're not there to give advice and tell people what to do. You're there to like walk alongside them. And that was, I think I learned how to do that much better coming at that from a psychology angle. And then really for me, it, I, it was a lot of writing and papers. And so I ended up writing a lot about weight bias and how, you know, obesity, nutrition and psychology intersected. And that was sort of the area that I found um, of interest in that and just learning about how that impacts our, our work so much. And I think that was another kind of game changer for me is you can't, you can't unsee that once you learn that you can't go back to just sort of like not knowing these parts of the brain that help people change their behavior and that it's not just uh, people are lazy and don't want to do the things we tell them to do. It's completely intersecting, you know, genetics and economics and socioeconomic status and all of these things that make it so complicated, but um, also giving you some actual concrete skills to navigate that with people felt like really nice. So Right. I think that, I think it's a, I think it's a good combination. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you mentioned about your, I know the last few years, your foray has been into weight management. What exactly besides your experience with your job got you intrigued in this area and why are you so passionate about it? I guess, you know, <laughs> what would you yeah. say? Um, 
Well, so I do have to laugh because I have two of my friends, Amanda and Molly, my two bariatric dietitians who worked at MUSC with me when I was kind of at that point of like, what do I do next? And I'm like, well, what else am I passionate about? I remember Amanda vividly telling me, she's like, Neen, it doesn't matter what you're going to do. You're going to be passionate about it. Like you are the passionate person. It's not necessarily the topic. And I always thought that was funny. I'm like, really? No, it has to be the topic. And so I think part of it is when I get involved in something and like really into it, um, I'm just going to be all in. And that's just kind of how I am. So for me, like I, you know, of course, the personal parts that we have about ourselves, you know, growing up and like maybe struggling with weight a little bit um, got me involved in that. But I think really, I just got kind of, I, I knew that the counseling aspect was going to be the thing that I was good at. And then looking back actually on these aptitude tests and all that, like I wanted to be a psychologist. I was really into psychology. I just didn't know when I decided to be a dietitian, I thought that was like giving up on psychology. And it really wasn't. It was just the beginning of that. And so I think that ended up being more the area that just intrigued me. And I mean, sadly, because obesity is everywhere, like that impacts almost all of our practice in a way. And kind of being a specialist in that really just gave me a lot of uh, professional, you know, fulfillment to some okay. extent. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, this is always a weird question to ask, but I'd like to ask it to everybody. You know, if you could do it all over again in your career, what would you change and what would you keep the same? Mm. I know I'm a big, like the path is winding and it'll take its way. And, you know, honestly, for me turning 40, new job, kind of new stuff in my personal life. What, what's really been interesting about this past year for me is I've really kind of stuck on this mantra of you can't picture what's next and kind of stop trying. Right. So like when people will say like, what's your five-year plan and what's your goals and even like a budget, which I cannot do for the life of me. I'm always like, I, I want to do that. That's something I want to do. But this year has really taught me that the more I try to figure out how to predict the future, the worse I am at it. And so what I've really been good at this past year, especially has been leaning into just letting this kind of weaving, you know, river or road or whatever you want to think about it as take me wherever and not picturing what's next. And the less you try to predict, the more you can just sort of be there for what's there and sort of awareness of it and kind of being open to it. That's been really that's been really helpful and it's been rewarding in all the ways for me. But I think in a more concrete way for some actual advice, other than just like, you know, take the ride. No, would no, be, uh, but I, but I do think for me, it would have been kind of that value myself financially, because for me, actually financial, that has not been a value of mine. And so I'm sort of like, well, if I do a really good job, they'll notice and pay me more. Obviously, that's how it works, right? No, that's not how it works. But that's how I always thought. And so, and I always thought like focusing on money was more materialistic and that just wasn't how I wanted to be. And what I'm realizing a little bit more, maybe kind of the psychology of money a little bit, is that um, like knowing your worth and knowing your value is important. And so rather than just being like, okay, I'll take this coordinator role. And if I do a really good job and work towards a director, then I'll, they'll just make that happen because that's the right thing to do. Um, what I would do next time or what I, you know, looking at, looking back, what I would do differently would be having a boundary of like, no, you know what? I am good at this. I am the right person for this job. And if they want me, they will pay for it. And if they don't, they don't get me. And so that is a, maybe a self-efficacy thing that I didn't have in a younger version of myself. But now I think I really would be able to make that kind of a statement and, and stick to it. So I think knowing, knowing your worth and knowing what you want is super important for, for that. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Uh, next question. What does the future hold for you? Ugh. 
and it could go anywhere. I'm on the river, right? So I'm, on, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm tubing down the river and trying to see where it goes. Um, yeah, so for me right now, I'm in a really good spot um, with Sika. I'm you know, getting to connect with my professional organizations. I'm, I'm, I've learned so much about the technology and, and body composition that I'm really just working with other providers to help them integrate that into their programs and their practice. Um, I think, you know, working on, there's, there's a whole big, we didn't get to talk too much, a whole big policy side of my, of my path, which has been really, really important, um, advocating for, um, you know, better obesity care for, you know, treat and reduce obesity act, which has been really the past 10 years that we've been talking about that, um, you know, working to get there's a bioimpedance has a CPT code, but it's a test code. So I'm really passionate about getting that to be elevated, to be a, um, reimbursable code within our, um, organizations to make that happen. So I think policy is definitely part of my future and I don't exactly know how that looks. Um, you know, I do, I do always have a place now for, um, obesity care because even in the, you know, 15, 20 years I've been in the field, we're finally just now actually seeing, I think this past year has seen such great movement from a public awareness kind of side, but also even just from some treatment options, you know, having some medications that help people in that gap between, you know, diet, exercise, behavior, and um, surgery, they haven't really had great medications. And now, you know, with these GLP-1s agonists, this has been a huge kind of, they call it a game changer, right, in the field. And how does that work with dietitians? This is something like I could talk about with you for a while, but getting... You know, we have programs that have medication, we have surgery, and they're not either or, right? They're, they always need this interdisciplinary team. And I think dietitians at the helm, you know, leading the way with nutrition and behavior and figuring out how people are going to integrate both of those things into their lifestyle. So I'm really passionate about the interdisciplinary team along with those, because I think you're not going to have success. I, I know that from surgery, you know, you can't just have surgery and, and that's it. So no, I know that, that's go, gonna be, right. right? Yeah. I know that's going to be part of this medication story as well as we've got to keep um, everybody on the idea of, you know, who are the people who are best poised to help folks integrate new lifestyle, you know, things into their permanent behavior. I, I mean, I think it's dietitians, psychologists, behavior, you know, mental health as well, exercise, whatever. But I do think that, um, you know, there's, that's going to be a big part probably of my future is making sure that we get um, interdisciplinary teams alongside some of these better treatment interventions that we have now. Okay. Awesome. Well, if you don't mind and you wanted to jump into the policy, what's, uh, what have you done in the past? And, uh, you know, just so, just so we're aware. I'm always intrigued, and I think this is probably one of these areas that a lot of dietitians in general aren't sure about the policy side yeah. of things. So, yeah, if you want to talk about Oh, my about gosh, it. me either. And I was totally not a – I was not a political person. I was totally on the side of, like, mm, no, that's not – that doesn't interact with my work life at all. Um, so, for me, policy became a passion when I was um, – when I was the president of South Carolina Dietetic Association, I got sent to the PPW public policy workshop back then. Um, and I just got to hear, you know, just really this integration of how, you know, advocating for what we do with lawmakers worked. And I just, I, I had no idea that that was how, how it worked. I, had, I thought it was scary. Like talking to a politician would be like this big thing I'd have to prepare for. And I wasn't good at that, but it turns out, you know, it's just conversations and I'm really good at that. And it's just, you always know more than them in every, in every conversation. And I would go into these conversations being like thinking I was going to talk about some policy. And really it's this person in front of you who's a vulnerable person saying, Oh, well, like I struggle with my weight. Like, what do you think I should do? And Oh my gosh, like I could rock those conversations any day. Right. <laughs> and so it, it was kind of this m meeting of, Oh, policy is just conversations with a different group of people that aren't paying you to be your patient. Um, and then seeing how important it was to actually turn that into um, you know, actual like effective 
policy that impacts our profession, whether that be reimbursement or better coverage or access to care. And so that's when it kind of started. Um, I think probably the most long-term success or interesting story I have would be when I got, so when obesity was finally kind of recognized as a disease back in 2013, so now 10 years ago, um, the South Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and like this whole group of people kind of were coming together like, okay, we're we're agreeing that obesity is a disease. How are we going to treat it? And how are we going to form policy around it? So as part of this group that, you know, I had to go to Columbia, which is our capital two hours away, a couple times we met as a group. We're trying to figure out what to do and craft a policy for nutrition counseling. And so in the very beginning, it was all these, you know, people thinking, okay, if we make this policy, everybody's going to be interested, right? Like, like, oh, they're so cute. They think everyone's going to come utilize our service. That'd be beautiful. That'd be great. But that's just not how it works necessarily. So I had to kind of give them a lot of reality of what the utilization could be. And I was really involved because I can't sit in a conference room and be quiet um, ever. And so... <laughs> I was really involved in that group and you know two two years later we finally got to the place where we had this policy it was nutrition counseling for obesity for medicaid in south carolina i think it at the time might have been one of the first where it was dietitians independently billing um, for nutrition counseling because it wasn't like this incident to a doctor code um and that was huge it was great and then it was okay now we have a policy. I was promising them this whole time that we would have dietitians available to do it. So then I had to advocate for with our own state, like you all have to have NPI numbers. You all have to sign up. I don't care if you never see a patient. I told them that we have 800 dietitians and, you know, a certain percentage of them are going to do it. And then it was getting them involved in that and kind of credentialing and uh, really getting the word out. So it was this really cool like start to finish and it's not finished ever, but projects that spanned a lot of years. And I think, I think a lot about grit and I listened to some podcasts about that. And I think this is an example of me having grit. Like I was in it. I was the, for the long haul. And the most rewarding part of all of that is I have gotten contacted recently and, you know, for the past few years, people who have turned over from, the Medicaid office from DHHS. And they're like, Hey, we know you've been involved from the start. Do you remember why we framed the policy this way? <laughs> and I'm like, Ooh, position of power. Um, really we meant to offer 26 visits a year. Come on. Don't mm -hmm. you remember that? Right. Right. Um, right. But yeah. So like I, I literally like outlived all the staff people who were involved in this policy and they still come to me to ask why we did it. I mean, that was, totally a reason to get involved in this kind of work if anything else and it it really makes me happy that we're still we're still working on it um i mean obviously there's a lot we can do but in policy there's it it's a long haul it's a grit it's a it's a grit game for sure so that was kind of my that's my most exciting story, but so many other stories. And I've, I'm very involved with the Obesity Action Coalition, which is a patient advocacy group um, because of all of that. And I think the patient voice in, in all sorts of different formats is important. You know, like nothing, nothing without us, nothing about us without us is kind of that, that feel like we shouldn't be having meetings without involving the patients that we're serving in that. We shouldn't be going to talk to policymakers about the treatments we provide without bringing patients along who've benefited from our services. And I think that's, that's a big part of it. And so, you know, kind of getting involved in policy led me to that group, which is, you know, sort of like I'm saying, all these different pieces leading to the next, that's a, that's one I'm really grateful for too. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I have appreciated all your, all your stories here and everything. So the final question for you is any words of wisdom for the up and coming or the next generation of dietitians? And I know you've dropped several things throughout. So if you wanted to, you can rehash or go through whatever, what do you think are your top things you would say? Sure. Well, I think, um, I think the saying yes to stuff early on and letting, you know, kind of your yeses lead to the next thing. I think that's big. Um, you know, I'm also notorious for not having the strongest of boundaries. And so some could criticize that as a boundary issue, but 
I think that actually has helped me get into all the things that I've gotten into is just being interested and excited about something and saying yes to the next version of that. Um, I think kind of having your support crew and your people, I think that's been huge for me. And so now, now that I'm working in a field where I'm the only dietitian, I'm the only healthcare provider on my small team. One of the things I've been doing is making sure that I still have my connection to my Debbie Pedipanes and my, you know, my bariatric dietitians. We have a group chat that we kind of re got together during COVID when we weren't at all the meetings together doing zoom chats. And now that's a really like strong support network for me. So I, I've realized how many of those types of networks that I need personally. So building those as you grow. And I know, you know, the, um, the spokesperson group, like that's another one who I think that's a really strong network of people who are just people that care about your success in a very non-competitive, non-threatening way. I love that. Um, but probably my biggest, like, lesson that I would tell people who are getting in this field, and this is a leadership thing at work and in all my professional organizations, is that don't do this project that you have a ton of passion for on your own. And I I can't say that I'm on the other side of this yet, but I'm working on it, which is I have been so involved and so excited about a project that, and when other people aren't around and not excited about it either, I just tackle it and go ahead, you know, all in and I'm working on it and I do it. And the problem with that is that you've just bought yourself that task or that job for the rest of your life if no one else is coming along with you. And so I would really say, you know, before you decide, okay, I'm like you're in a state dietetic association and you're really passionate about this project. Nobody else is around and saying that they're interested. So you just go do it. Well, when you rotate off that board, it probably is what gonna happens? die if nobody else is there helping and excited about it. So, or at work, you know, I've, you know, I left my position and I, you know, was really passionate about so many things and I just did them myself and nobody else was listening or caring about the stuff that I was into. I just did it. And that worked while you're doing it. But as soon as you want to back out and I'm a, and I'm an ideas person, like I'm much better at the creation and I want to hand it off to someone to sustain the thing if you don't have people along that way, there's no one to sustain your thing and you'll be burnt out if you're just tackling new stuff yourself. So that would be my, definitely my like words of wisdom to someone in the field is at whatever cost, figure out how to get a team and a couple other people along with you to do it. And, um, and that'll be the way to, I I don't want to say like a legacy necessarily, but kind of, you know, if you want your, really great idea, which is great. But if you're the only one there involved and you're not telling people about what you're doing and talking about your successes along the way and getting people excited about carrying it on, um, you know, either it's going to die when you leave or (laughs) you're going to die and and no one will be there to carry it on. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Awesome. Well, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you very much for coming on. I'm also on the platform Buy Me A Coffee. This is a platform that allows creators like myself to create content and get rewarded in a variety of payments. I've decided to do it via coffee. So if you'd like to buy me a coffee, you can do so. And if you want to send one to the individual I'm interviewing, send it to me and I will send it their way. With that being said, thank you very much for being here with us today. I hope you really enjoyed the video and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye.